This is Tyrese Halliburton, and you're listening to Setting the Pace. Pacer Nation, what is going on? Welcome back to another episode here of your go-to Pacers podcast, Setting the Pace. The Indiana Pacers were in Chicago for a basketball game tonight that took place, and they watched a show by the Harlem Bull Trotters as the Chicago Bulls took down Indiana 125-99. to Pacers close out this road trip 3-2, and two, and making his return from a, a few episode break as he was on uh, some bus- on a business trip is, is Michael J. Vachi. And Vachi, what a return to come back to. Yeah, that's one way to put it. You know, just like the Pacers, I was ready to go home. All right, being on the road, traveling, you know, sometimes just like you said before, and you can relate to it, you just want to be in your own bed. And I think that we saw that it was evident in Chicago the end of a road trip and a Pacers team that never quite showed up. I think their their minds might have been elsewhere. Their hearts might have been in Indiana. But it wasn't on that court tonight, unfortunately. And the Pacers scoring sub-100 points, ugh, not good. Yeah, and this honestly, to me, I was a little bit surprised by the performance tonight, Fachi. I will not lie. I mean, understand. Well, we'll talk about this here first. You know, this was the fifth game in eight nights. So, and they've been on the road quite a bit. So I understand why there could be some fatigue and some travel, uh, you know, just, just tired of traveling, that kind of thing. And we see this happen all the time at the Pacers on the tail end of a road trip. They always seem to kind of lose that last game before they come home. And I'm pretty sure if you look across the league, it's, it's a very common thing where players yeah. and, and teams lose those games at the tail end of road trips. But with everything that was in, in the Pacers' hands tonight, the ability to – Tie this series with Chicago, a team that they've really struggled with. Now they end up losing that series three to one. Uh, this could be a team potentially they might face in a play-in situation if you know worse comes to worse. But also, you had Miami lose the night before. Philadelphia loses in heartbreak fa- heartbreak fashion tonight against the Clippers, and Orlando lost to Golden State. Like every team that Cavaliers lost as well to the Hornets. Like all these teams that were losing around your area uh, in the standings and the Pacers aren't able to take advantage of it. I mean, the fact that they really weren't competitive in this game, Fachi, at all is what makes it very frustrating just because, yes, it, it was a tired leg, so like we mentioned, but like I think that a lot of this just came down to poor execution and, and poor effort. I think so, and it's unfortunate because you don't want to chalk this up as a loss due to the five games and eight nights, end of a road trip, but it felt like that is a real thing in the NBA, and I don't want to make excuses for this Pacers team because, you know, it is, it is. hey, you could say it's Chicago, but Chicago has also had our number this year, and it's, it's frustrating because it's not a great Chicago team, but like you said, three wins over the Pacers out of four this year, it's disappointing, and the Pacers were coming off of that high of that win against the Clippers, which was a really great win, but from it just felt like from the first quarter and on, the Pacers just never really looked like they were in control. They only scored 23 points early on, and that really set the tone for a game where they, the Pacers were never a threat at one point. They, they, they cut it down to seven, and I felt like that was really as close as the Pacers were able to get. I mean, this was a 20-point a game at halftime, and, and Chicago never really had to look over their shoulder in this one. Yeah, cutting it down to seven in the third quarter, like I'm just a little bit disappointed that the Pacers gave us some false hope that maybe they could make this a bit of a game. And I kept thinking to myself, well, if they get it to single digits by the end of the quarter, all right, let's see what can happen. But, you know, they get it to seven, and I'm thinking, all right, they're they're right there. They're knocking on the door. I mean, I just watched them. I stayed up late to watch them play the Lakers and knock down a 17-point lead and cut it to three a few different times there with a few minutes left in the game. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, can they come back against Chicago like – I've I've seen crazier things happen already this season from other teams uh, just a few days ago with what Atlanta did to Boston and how they came back and won that game. But yeah, honestly, like I'm just a little bit sad that we got to see a false hope in the third quarter because me and you could have started this podcast recording about an hour, hour and a half ago I've been sleeping. And, and I've been sleeping right now. So, you know, screw you Pacers for, for giving me false hope in the third quarter. But, you know, it, it just once again, it, it's the margin for error, Slim Fachi. So, I mean, let me ask you, though, I mean, is this a good enough excuse to say tired legs was the reason they lost this game? It is. And I know there's going to be some fans listening to this, whether you're driving, whether you're in the gym, whatever you're doing, it's going to be, that's not good enough. That can't be the excuse, but it does feel like a real thing. And maybe five games and eight nights feels like old school NBA. When I say old school NBA, NBA of like 10 years ago or so, where you used to play a lot of games, like almost like the three games and four nights type of situation. So, Five games in eight nights, that, that that's a lot for today's NBA. 
And I just feel like the Pacers were, they were off to a good start in this road trip. They really were. This was an opportunity to go four and one on the yeah. road. And that would have been really, really good. So we did see some good things in this road trip, but tonight against Chicago, whether it's a combination of just Chicago matching up very well against Indiana or not, I just felt like the Pacers didn't have it. There's plenty of players that that kind of just were not them, themselves, but I think overall you could chalk this up to a scheduling type of situation where I'm not going to say it could have been anybody on the other end, but like when you look at what the Pacers showed tonight offensively, I mean, they didn't crack 100 points. I think that's either the first time that happened this year. It is. The first time the Pacers didn't crack 100 on defense, they were nowhere to be found either. They give up 125. It's just something that I feel like you want to be able to get back home and forget about. Yeah, and, and, you know, that is a fair, you know, sentiment. It's a fair way to feel about this team, saying, you know what, it was a long road trip and all that, but – I, I don't know why, but I felt today, like <laughs> all throughout the day, like this is going to be a pretty good game. I think the Pacers are actually going to pull this one out because we've seen this team have bounce back games against teams that have, you know, had their number in a, in a tough loss. Like they took care of Chicago on the road the first time after Chicago had beat them at home in a pretty ugly loss. I think that was like a 112 105 loss. And I mean, we thought that seven point loss to Chicago was just nasty. Like now they lose by 26 on the road to him. But I just thought after the three game, loss at home in overtime like there would still be a little bit of an emotional uh charge from that game like the Pacers would come out with a little bit more uh extra energy knowing how important this game was for that tiebreaker scenario and just you know everything involved with it just like that we got to get this team back from what they did to us but man it was just a, a complete no show from this team and you hate to you hate to see it from that because I know a lot of fans probably listening to this podcast right now you're just diehards because who is tuning in to a post-game recap of a 26-point loss to the Bulls? Like, not very many people. So thank you for listening if you are. But my goodness, this was just an unfortunate game for the Pacers. And I'm kind of hoping that they're a little bit more rested and ready for the Lakers on, on Friday. Because to me, like, I understand winning against the Bulls was probably more important. But I really want to see the Pacers beat the Lakers after what just took place on, on Sunday with the, the foul discrepancy that you will hear me talk about probably for the next – couple of weeks because i still can't believe how crazy that was no i mean that, that was honestly ridiculous and i just feel like it's always such an uphill battle beating the lakers that you need to convincingly beat the lakers when we're talking about needing to convincingly beat the lakers i'm actually still not over a couple of years ago when duarte didn't get the four-point play mm. and that would have won it so i mean it just really feels that you know that there can't be that small margin of error um, so yeah, I want to respond against the Lakers. I know that the Pacers kind of emptied out, you know, the deep end of the bench in this game. I, I think they probably could have did it a little bit earlier. I think the Pacers were just, they looked lifeless in that fourth quarter, but you know, the, the, the tough part is, is in a 26 point loss, you know, guys like Siakam and, and Tyrese Halliburton, and they still played 30 plus minutes mm. each. So it's not like this is, Hey, we got blown out, but they only played about 20 to 25 minutes. No, they, they still got their 30-plus their minutes in, so it's a little bit unfortunate. And for both players tonight, Halliburton and Siakam, I just felt that it, it wasn't their night. But one thing that I, I really want to point out, you know, in specific for Siakam is seven shots. Seven. He had six coming into the fourth quarter. This is a guy that had absolutely been lighting it up. He had 29 shots against the Lakers. He had 20 against the Clippers. He finishes this game with seven shots. I, I just don't think that it's, that's, and we've, we've talked about it. Hey, it never feels like it's enough to, to get arguably a fourth of the shots that you got a couple nights ago. I mean, that's just never going to get it done. Now, I will say this in the defense of them not giving him the ball as much. He did have 11 free throws in this game. So yeah, no, that's definitely, definitely that's, you know, very relevant. It, that's it, it, probably around five more shots there you can add to the mix. So that's about 12 shots, which still, is about average for what he gets against the the Bulls because he was eight of twelve last time they played. So, you know, I mean, really, Halliburton was kind of chucking some threes there in the third quarter. It felt like just really trying to. He had some good looks, but they just weren't falling. And if you hear me and Caitlin Cooper talk about it on, on yesterday's show, like she was talking about how he was getting like wide open looks against Golden State and LA with their their coverages. Some of these threes were wide open, and he just wasn't hitting them. So, I don't I don't know what to tell you there. It's just. Part of the ups and downs of Tyrese Halliburton post-injury. But 
you're right. I mean, Siakam, like you look at the box score, it looks bad too, seven in, in 30 minutes. But I did like how aggressive he was at the free throw line and, and trying to get there. Uh, it, it was just a weird game from everybody. Just really ugly. That's the only way to put it. Like this team scored 99 points. Like 99. <laughs> that's oh. not that many. You know, that's that's the the lowest, like you said, of the season so far. And it, it's just not who this team is. So it was just a bad game overall. But I, I do want to kind of transition here, Fachi, to our next point. And there is a player that just came back from injury in this game, did not play against the Clippers. That's Aaron Neesmith. And, and I'm curious, are, are you concerned at all with his play since the injury that he had prior to the one that he just uh, received against the Lakers? Because it seems like, to me, he doesn't feel like the same player that he was uh, since going down uh, in that game against Toronto. No, he doesn't seem like the same player. And we talked about it maybe about a week ago or so, that it's like for most of this season, Aaron Neesmith was the most consistent pacer. I felt that he was someone that you could rely on night in, night out, extremely efficient from the field. You know, overall, you know, shooting about for many months, 50% from the field. Great to see from three-point line, lighting it up. It, it feels like it's actually been quite some time since he's – and he's had some games where he's been, you know, maybe like a 5 of 10, but there's been a lot of those – Two of 11 tonight, three of 11 versus Golden State, you know, whether it's a four of nine or four four of 12 last time against Chicago. I mean, two of 10 against Minnesota. There's been a lot of struggles, and I just feel like, yeah, you know he's going to hustle. He's going to play hard, but he has not really been that the, the same Aaron Eastman that we saw earlier in the year that was taking that big step forward. It's more like he's starting to, uh, you know, not, not come down a bit, but it's like you want to be playing your best basketball Come playoff time, it's now been at least about a good month, I feel like, since he's been playing vintage Aaron Neesmith basketball from earlier this season. Yeah, I mean, you talk about the numbers in, in this game tonight, two of nine from three. Two of those came in the fourth quarter, and I think that's the last two that he actually took. So he was probably 0 of 7 before that. And it's like if he's getting 11, you know, 11 shot attempts and he's 2 of 11, like, is he taking too many shots? Is he looking for his offense a little bit too much? I'm not even sure. I would have to go back and watch to see how many of those were good looks versus four shots. But to me, the Aaron Neesmith that we saw, you know, a couple months ago is not the same Aaron Neesmith we're seeing now. And it looks like, I don't know, I'm trying to figure out exactly the best fit for him with this team. You know, we kind of had this conversation last year, like, is he a starter? Is he more of a bench guy? And it felt like, man, he's really a starter this year. He's shooting like 46% from three, and I still think he's shooting at a high rate. Is. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm a little bit torn on what I think of him right now. I don't want to be too much of a prisoner of the moment with him. But I am a little bit concerned. Uh, only a few more games to kind of get yourself right before the playoffs, and I'm hoping that the playoffs kind of just uh, allow him to kind of take that, you know, that level up in his game right there, Fachi, to be more impactful than he has been so far. But right now... Uh, the poor shooting number is just the, I feel like he's been a little bit sloppy and a little bit rushed on the court when he's played, which has been something he's done his whole career, but it seemed like he got better at that. But now it feels like he has more timely turnovers and, and timely mistakes that stick out than they had more than they had previously. No, it's true though. And, and he was O of six at halftime. And that was the frustrating part where he's O of six, but Siakam's only got four shots. And I, I just felt like this is someone that when you say, is he taking too many shots? At times, you know, he's he's good for double-digit shots. And on many, many teams, I feel like that's not really the case. I mean, there's plenty of games this month where he's had 11, you know, 11, 10, 12, 12, 10 shots. And if you don't have it that night, and most of those nights, to be honest, he hasn't had it. It, it is the, the 2 of 11s or the 3 of 11s. It's just like sometimes you got to know when it's not your night and just kind of stick to, you know, I don't want to say stick to what you do best, but it's like, he, he's someone that on most teams I think would thrive in being that sixth man, but he's still good enough to potentially in the playoffs, if he has it going, I feel like Aaron Eastman is the kind of player that can swing a game with a hot shooting night. If he can be, you know, really efficient from three, I think that that's a game that the Pacers maybe can, you know, beat a team that maybe they weren't expected to. But if he is playing like he's playing right now and giving you a three of 11 performance, he's probably going to shoot you out of that game because I just feel like right now, if there's uh if your top two guys and Siakam and Halliburton don't really have it, those are the games that you definitely need an Aaron Neesmith to have it. And I feel like quite frankly, tonight, the three of them, or at least, you know, I, I'd say Halliburton and Neesmith from the field absolutely just did not have it. 
it's a tough one. I mean, I, everybody loves Aaron e. Smith. I think everybody's rooting for him. I, I have so many people stop me and tell me how much I love the way he plays the game. And so it, it's just a bit of a stretch for him. You know, we got to give Tyrese to Hallib Halliburton the, the benefit of the doubt there uh, with his slump and his struggles. I think you have to do the same thing for a guy like Aaron e. Smith, who who is very impactful to this team, specifically on the defensive side of things. And you can kind of feel uh, this team looked a lot different against the Bulls in the second half when Neesmith went out of the game, when when Siakam went out of the game. And it's just like, you know, this Pacers team is still kind of missing that starting small forward, in my opinion, because mm -hmm. uh, you, you need someone that's probably got more of the Jairus Walker build, right, versus maybe someone more of the Neesmith build. Because tonight when you're watching Andrew Nimhart guard DeMar DeRozan, it doesn't matter how good the defense is. DeMar DeRozan's got two or three inches on him. And so – even if Nimhard's right in his grill and playing great defense, it, you know DeRozan can get that shot off over him just because he's got a little bit of a, a height advantage, a, a, a bit of a height advantage, excuse me, and and that to me is just something like you have to live and deal with that stuff. But you know, I, I feel like for Neesmith, it he's been so good this year that it's really hard to criticize him too much. But yeah, I agree, he gets a bit of a pass. He yeah, does. but it, it's we still do. you can tell he definitely is just going through a bit of a slump, and it does stink. It, it does, and I think that, you know, uh, these players, this is why, like, they're human. Everybody's going to go through a slump at some point. It's unfortunate, but it's like you just want to be playing your best basketball as April's coming to an end. Right now, it's March that's coming to an end. There still is some time, but it, it's just, like, you want to be, like, you know, that team almost like the Miami Heat are where, like, they tend to play their best basketball at the end of the year, and I just feel like for the Pacers – they don't have that ability to just flip a switch and, and just get it going. So you want to use these remaining, say, you know, nine games or so, eight, nine games to really make it count and mm -hmm. get back into playing that vintage Pacers basketball that we're seeing from time to time, but not maybe as much consistently. So I think uh, for Aaron Neesmith, I think there are better days ahead. I think he's going to be just fine. But I think that unfortunately this Pacers team – really counts on Neesmith to be, you know, one of those maybe, hey, your your fourth option. And I think that on, on a lot of teams, they wouldn't really count on him to be, you know, that fourth scoring option. Fachi, let's go ahead and take a quick break uh, from our, our conversation now and tell our listeners about our great sponsor over at the Blue Wire Podcast Network, Unified Healing. Let's go ahead and talk about that right now. Fachi, I'm glad you're back for today's episode because I've got to talk to you about Unified Healing. Whether you're a world-class athlete like myself or, or a podcaster like yourself, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and, and proper recovery for top-notch performance. The Indiana Pacers are going to need the best recovery for their top-notch performance after getting beaten down by the Chicago Bulls 125-99. They've got a game against the Lakers, so they got to get back on track. So that's why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of Setting the Pace. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement Systems, or EE Systems. So, Fachi, if you haven't heard of the EE System yet, you're going to want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. So, whether you're in New York like yourself or in Indiana where I'm at, or other hundreds of locations across the globe, access to a center is, guess what, easy and affordable. That's right, easy and affordable. So, if you're interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself, go to unifiedhealing.com slash pace to learn more and find a center near you. That's unifydhealing.com slash pace, P-A-C-E. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, including EE system. Baji, let's get back to the show. Let's keep this conversation moving. We've been talking about Aaron Neesmith's struggles and maybe the other guy that we've talked about a lot earlier this year and how much high praise we had for him. Jalen Smith feels like he's been going through a little bit of a slump as well. And I, I think you can really say it's just been up and down for him since the All-Star break. And there, there's some really good Jalen games. There's some games that don't look so good. And tonight was another example of a game that didn't look the greatest form going up against Andre Drummond. We've seen Andre Drummond present plenty of problems for Pacer Bigs over the years. But 
uh, you know, Andre Drummond just looked like he was about 60 to 70 pounds heavier than Jalen Smith out there on the court. And Jalen Smith was not really able to take advantage of his three point th- uh, shot to kind of spread Drummond out from the paint. So I just felt like uh, this might have been a matchup thing, but definitely just not the greatest uh, night for Jalen Smith. No, it definitely wasn't. I feel like the the, the Bulls' bigs just really uh, took it to Jalen, and, and and it showed. I mean, Jalen Smith in this game, uh, you know, not really one to write home about a, a, a negative twenty. He was minus twenty, you know, on, on the box score. He only played twelve minutes. That's bad. So that says a lot. But yeah, for Drummond, someone who's given the Pacers fits dating back to his days in Detroit. I mean, he pulls off a double double in just eighteen minutes. And uh, it, it wasn't Jalen's best night. And I think that for, for now, like just it's funny that we're following up on Neesmith because Neesmith and Jalen Smith, I think, were those two players in the beginning of the year that took the biggest step forward from that internal growth and were just huge for the Pacers. And I feel like both of those guys now, you're they're still very vital to what the Pacers are doing, but I feel like they just have not been able to count on them as much. And Jalen from the field, he, he's still shooting a good percentage. It's, it's about 40% from three uh, this this month, but it feels to be a little bit inconsistent. I mean, he goes three or three against Golden State, and then since then, the last three games, he he's, uh, he's only made one three in that span. So a little bit inconsistent, and I think on a night like tonight, just it didn't look like he was a, a, a good matchup against Chicago. No, it definitely did. And, and I will say this too, like with the slumps that he's been going through, you kind of started to see on this road trip anyway, Isaiah Jackson have more of an impact. We saw Isaiah Jackson get the minutes in his hometown of uh, Michigan uh, when they played they Detroit. And, and he had a great game in that game. Did not play at all uh, against Golden State. Uh, that was the Jalen Smith was back in the backup five role. And you kind of felt like, okay, things are back to normal. But then when you watch him play the Lakers, Jalen Smith got the nod early on, but it was not uh, working out too well. They put Isaiah Jackson into the game, and Isaiah Jackson really was more impactful than Jalen Smith in that game. And in the Clippers game, they still kind of rode with Jalen again, but then in this game against the Bulls, they rode with Jalen, but towards the end there, you kind of just saw Isaiah Jackson doing a lot of different things that Jalen Smith cannot do, and that's just like the the pure athleticism. Uh, Some of those left-handed dunks Jalen, or excuse me, Isaiah had in traffic, like, it's it's funny to kind of see how those two play, and I tweeted this out, and I, and I feel like everybody would be in agreement with me. Like, if Isaiah Jackson can just find a consistent three-point jumper in the offseason, somewhere around like 30% from three, I'm not even asking him to be like an average three-point shooter, but just enough of a threat out there that he can knock one down every once in a while, I think that's going to open up his game a little bit more because we're starting to see him find ways to put the ball on the floor here and there. Like it's not a big sample size, but uh, kind of be a little bit more nifty with his handle and not just be a guy that catches and dunks the ball. Like the way he's blocking shots, he's just playing with this like chip on his shoulder. And, and I feel like that is really coming from the fact that he's not getting the minutes that he wants to get. And he's got a contract coming up too. I think they picked up that option, but still, you know, it's just like that rookie contract is getting one year closer to being a standard contract, and he hasn't really been more than just a third string center in his career. So uh, you can tell, like, he's kind of chopping at the bit to to, to take Jalen's role. And when he's been out there to play, I feel like he's produced quite a bit. That's the thing. It's like for when you see the, the lack of minutes that Isaiah gets, it's not from underperforming. I feel like when he gets an opportunity, he always makes the most of it. And I feel like, you know, obviously not to relate him to a TJ McConnell, but there is a McConnell-like factor of a spark when he's out there. He just makes these plays that that has you saying, okay, so, something's a little bit different right now. Like, he had a monstrous block in the fourth quarter. I mean, look, the game was completely out of reach, but like you could feel that block. He blocked it into the stands. And in, by, by a season – He's having a, a good season for the amount of minutes that he gets. Alex, he's actually playing a career low amount of minutes this year, just 13 minutes per game. But I feel like when he comes in, he's he's playing good basketball. And I just felt like he's been a good rebounder. You know, he can block shots. He, he's, he's, he knows what he's good at. You're talking about could he add a three-point shot to his game? We saw him make a couple threes in college. That was four years ago at this time. Then his rookie year – he goes five of 16 from three. That's actually 31%. So that's in that range that you were talking about. Of, could he even be a respectable three-point shooter? But just two made threes last year. 
and he's he's oh four this year. So it's really not something that we've ever seen him even give himself a chance at being able to do. And at this point, I know you don't want you know Carlisle of all people is not really going to want. Isaiah to be developing like a mid-range jumper or anything like that, but you want to see some sort of growth. And I felt like you and I were amongst the hardest on him, you know, out of any player on this team coming into this season. And he's answered a lot of questions for us. And at times you got to say, Hey, you know what? Maybe he could provide something that, that Jalen's not providing, but obviously I don't know if we've fully gotten to that point yet. Yeah. I mean, Jalen Smith, like that outside shot is really just, and, and you'll hear me and Caitlin Cooper talk about this tomorrow. We go a little bit more in depth uh, about that matchup. And I, and I want to let her kind of explain that and not take any of the points that she made away from what she said. So I'll leave it at that. But I think you can kind of just tell, like, we know, like, the whole reason why I think Jalen was getting the minutes that he was was just because of his outside threat. You know, that's mm-hmm. a big thing there. And, and there's been times to me where he's been more of a, uh, a fundamental rebounder, a better fundamental rebounder than Isaiah Jackson. Isaiah Jackson can get to the ball quicker than anybody on this team, probably off the glass. Maybe him and Obi Toppin would have a little bit of a competition on that. But but still, like, he's just got such a knack for the basketball when it comes off the rim. And uh, he's he's a he's a guy that really does look like he could fit with this team and the style they want to play. But he does also bring just that element of surprise because if you do, you have that luxury, right, to be able to play him a little bit more if for some reason you are having issues with with Jalen not clicking with that second unit, you can say, okay, we got Isaiah Jackson here as our third string center, like probably one of the better third string centers in the league. So uh, he's a guy that could easily play backup center minutes in the league. I, I've seen enough of a sample size to feel confident in that, but uh, he is he's limited with what he can do, and I think that if he can expand upon that, that's big for him. But I, I still don't want to write off Jalen Smith just yet because Jalen Smith, like the year has been so good for him. And Zach Lowe even gave him a shout out on his latest podcast saying, you know, uh, shout out Jalen Smith for kind of having a comeback year. And it doesn't always happen overnight for these guys. It might take year three, year four before they get to that point. But, you know, uh, it's been a fun story for Jalen Smith. I just hope it doesn't kind of ride off into the sunset right now. And he can continue to just continue to build and build what he's already done so far this season and not just kind of celebrate what he's done and how far he's come. Because to me, there's still potential for him to be better. Oh, I mean, he has every opportunity right now to to really, if he can play his best basketball, this is the time to cash in because I feel like Jalen Smith's the kind of guy that if he has a good playoff series for the Pacers, that's going to make a big difference in terms of if he wants to opt out or not. And I feel like this is this is truly that big time for him to cash in on a, on a real contract because I don't think that he got the type of money that people thought he might get last time around. So, you know, it, that this is a guy that has a lot of money to gain in the month of April. For sure, Patrick. Let's move on to our last talking point here. Um, I want to get your thoughts on how you think the Pacers should handle Jairus Walker's minutes moving forward. Really great game in the, uh, against the Clippers. Got a little bit of run there in the first half uh, against Chicago, but not the greatest showing from him. Nothing spectacular. Really jumped off the page, but... How do you think the Pacers should continue to use Jairus Walker and play him in the rotation? I just think he needs some sort of more consistent opportunity. They they did the classic where like, you know, Jairus played a couple of minutes early on in this game and then and then he comes it out and then doesn't play anything until, you know, when the game's completely out of reach. But it's just like it's weird because Carlisle was so, you know, complimentative of, of him against that the Clippers and what he brought to the table in that game. And he was great. And we saw last time he played Chicago, he was good too. Mm-hmm. He had 10 points in that game and four boards. He played 24 minutes. So this time around, only 11 minutes. Like I said, about half of those were in garbage time. So I think they got to find some sort of role for him. But it's not enough to just play that four-minute stint in the first half, you know, in the second quarter for, for a little bit, and then just not play again. So – I think that when the Pacers have given him, you know, ample playing time, I think that he's been able to show, you know, a lot. He's got actually in this month alone two games where he's had six assists or more. You know, he's had rebounding efforts that are good. He he's shown that he, we all know that he can score the ball, but you got to be able to find him more than four minutes in a night. I feel like. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think he played six minutes in the second half of that closing quarter, or mm-hmm. yeah, that last quarter in the fourth. He didn't play at all in the third. And he played, like you mentioned, like two in the first, three in the second. Kind of carried over with those minutes, kind of, you know, playing him with the second unit. But nothing 
really to build off there. And the bench was not good in this game tonight, so I don't think it helped him at all. Really, the bench had nothing going. And I mm. feel like this is this is why it kind of brings me into this. It's just like if you need a spark, Jarris Walker has actually been that spark at times. He was definitely that spark against the Clippers at times. And I, it just feels like a night, if you look at this, the, the bench had, you know, you had McConnell doing doing what he does. He gave you 12. But mm-hmm. how common is it for the Pacers to not have anyone else give you more than six? And that came with Isaiah Jackson late in the game. The Pacers essentially didn't have anybody else on that bench contribute, period, in this game. Yeah, it was not a normal bench night for the Pacers. And I will say this, the first, you know, the two nights the Pacers lost against the Lakers and the Bulls, it felt like they kind of got rid of their normal rotation uh, of where Siakam kind of goes out early, comes back in with the second unit, that kind of thing. Uh, definitely did not happen in the third quarter uh, with that group. So, you know, to me, it's just like, okay, maybe there is a recipe for success with this team. And it's kind of like, if you get them out of that flow of the rotation based on how guys are playing or foul trouble, like it could kind of impact how this team is balanced and, and what they're trying to do. But yeah, there was too many stretches there in that, especially in the second half where it was just not enough offensive firepower out there for this team. But I, I will say this with, with Jairus Walker, like, you you've got to find a way to get him some more meaningful minutes. Uh, I'm sorry, I just don't think that Doug McDermott should crack the rotation whatsoever. Um, I mean, yes, he had some nice shots go in against the Lakers. Let's be honest; like he had a nice little moment there. But if you're trying to get better defensively, like the upside is there for for Jarris. And if he's playing like really bad, you have that luxury of putting Doug in form because he is a veteran. You know what you're gonna get from him, but. I felt like Rick Carlisle against the Lakers left McDermott in way too long towards in that fourth quarter and couldn't get Nimhard back into the game quick enough. But if you have a guy like Jarris out there instead, someone that's going to at least provide you some level of defensive threat, uh, you know, it's, I mean, yeah, they might still attack him, but I trust him being attacked in a one-on-one matchup more so than I give any, you know, trust with Doug McDermott. So to me, it's like, I know that there's, a fine balance between those two. But like, I think there's even games, you know, we saw it against the Clippers, like maybe give Jairus Walker more minutes than Ben Shepard. Uh, I know Ben Shepard's probably earned those minutes a little bit more, but still like, why shouldn't Jairus get a chance? And, and we saw this, and this is my last point before I let you respond to the, all, everything I'm throwing at you, but we saw Jairus look his best with the starting five. So why not try to get him in there with those guys maybe have him sub in early for Neesmith when he is struggling the way that he is and see if that group together makes a little bit more sense because they, you know, I think that Jairus provides more uh, offensively with his playmaking abilities than what you're going to get from Neesmith in that regard. So uh, that would have been something I would have tried maybe in the third quarter, something like that, uh, or maybe even in the second quarter with Neesmith struggling the way that he was just to kind of give Jairus an opportunity with that group that played so well against the Clippers. Yeah, I, I think the second and third quarter would have been the time to do that, specifically the second where I feel like things just weren't going the Pacers' way. But like, what more does Jarrett Walker have to do when it's like he played 29 minutes against the Clippers? I felt like really, you know, like, I don't want to say proved himself because he's obviously still a rookie, but like I just felt like with the amount of praise that he got, you would have thought that would have led to just more minutes. And, and like we said, if this wasn't a blowout, Jarris Walker might finish this game with five minutes played after playing so good against the Clippers that it's just like, when is it just going to be his opportunity to consistently get that? And actually, we're looking at it right now. Okay. Because I guess he logged 11 minutes technically. This is the first time that he's played uh, back-to-back games, playing 10 minutes or more, dating back to January when plenty of guys were in and out of the roster. So mm. uh, I didn't have the lineup. So it's, that's that's just not good. I mean, the, the the consistency has not been there. Get this man's confidence up by giving him actual playing time that he can count on a little bit, even if, if it is ten minutes. Uh, you know, in a night. Yeah, no, I agree with you, Bachi. I think we just have to kind of be patient. I, I'm never going to get. A, I'm never expecting minutes for Jairus. But I would just maybe like to see it a little bit more, knowing the situation you know with the injuries that are there. And I know McDermott's back, but it took him, you know, a lot of shots to to make a three finally in the fourth quarter. And yeah, I mean, what is his future with this team? I just don't really see it. And I don't think he's making that much of an impact with the, what they're doing now. Like, yeah, he can spread the floor, and I'm not trying to deny that. Like, I think 
every team that guards him is going to respect him more as a three point shooter yes. than Jairus Walker. There's no doubt about it. Like he just is a different mover, different kind of uh, pulls a little bit more gravi- gravity wise. And so, yeah, I- I'm not surprised by that at all. Like, yeah, he he can he can kind of do some of the buddy healed stuff in terms of you know the, drawing the attention from the outside, but. You know, Jairus just does about everything else better than three point shooting than him. I mean, maybe the maybe the cutting is not as good either, but like the passing, the rebounding, um, the basketball IQ. I, I would probably say, you know, Doug's a pretty smart basketball player. There's no doubt about that. So, I uh, don't want to get down that, you know, the argument there. But yeah, yeah it's just uh, you, you kind of feel for the guy, and, and I want to see him continue to grow with this team. There's been a lot of talks like he could maybe start playing more three than four, and just the idea of him getting as many opportunities with Pascal here and, and not trying to force it, but just allowing it to happen naturally, it, it would be, would be fun to watch. And I think you can kind of have a, a shorter leash on Jairus because if he gets kind of loose a little bit, maybe he does uh maybe you do pull him early, but if he can kind of stay confined a little bit and understand what his role is, why not see what he can do? I really do hope that he has that opportunity down the stretch. Cause we've always found that the last couple of games, for players, some crazy stuff happens in the NBA. I mean, you know, those those last game or two when you really get to be unleashed, I think that would be massive for his confidence. And it just feels like that's a good opportunity to give a guy like Doug McDermott a little, little bit of time off. Because what are the odds in the playoffs that, like, McDermott's going to swing a game? I just don't think so. I don't. But I feel that there are certain plays that and there could be a game that maybe if Jarris Walker is able to have some play in it, Maybe he's able to make a couple impactful plays. You know, maybe it just energizes this group. I don't know. Do I expect him to have an opportunity to play 15 to 20 minutes? I don't. But I think that if given an opportunity, he he could be able to, you know, spark this team in a way that McDermott just isn't going to ever, uh, I feel like, swing momentum right now for this mm. Pacers team. Well, and one other point, too, that I'll bring up before we kind of close this show out is just the fact that that Jairus has not put a lot of miles on his body this year. He's had a lot of coaches – uh, did not play coach's decisions. And, and yes, he did spend some time in the G League, but it's not like he was just constantly putting the amount of miles that these guys that are regular in the rotation are doing for 82 games. So he's going to be fresher probably towards the end of the season more than a lot of these guys that are, are probably kind of getting tired and ramping themselves up for the playoffs. So that to me is where he could be really impactful. Uh, and, and, and especially some of these regular season games. Playoffs aside, this is where he could be really impactful in a regular season game. It's like, you're you're playing a team that's maybe on the second night of a back to back or their third game in four nights and all right so they're a little bit tired well you're going to play the Pacers pace which is always difficult to do and on top of that you get a deal with Jairus Walker a six foot seven forward with a seven foot two wingspan who has just been waiting you know like a ball of energy just just to explode and go out there and, and wreak havoc so that to me is just like one other element of of why playing Jairus now could make some sense because he just doesn't have that extra wear and tear on his body and could be really helpful and a little bit more energized uh, these last eight games. No, I really do think so. When I mentioned before, it's like I remember last year, like the last game of the season, Kenneth Lofton Jr. put up like 40 points. I truly really? believe that if you unleash Jairus, he might be able to get like 20 points at the end of the season in a game that might not matter for the team that we're playing or anything like that, but would be so critical for his confidence going into – Hey, some of these games, look, you might only get a couple of minutes in the playoffs, but if if that that run goes well, then who knows? So it'd be fun. I definitely think though, over the last month or two, and even specifically, even the last, you know, game against the Clippers, you see those flashes to be like, okay, you know what, there there is more of a three over here. And I do, I'm excited to be able to count on Jarris next year. It's just frustrating frustrating to see the highs and lows of him play well and then it not being followed up with at least really an opportunity yes like we said he did get 11 minutes tonight but it felt like um it, it wasn't the same type of opportunity that you might have hoped for coming off of that big performance yeah that's a, that's a great point Fudge. and this is a good way to close this one out obviously uh i think we got to give a shout out to nim who probably had the best game overall in, in this one for the pacers and, and really kind of had some nice you know, stretches there in the third quarter where he kind of stepped up and hit some big shots. But yeah, just overall from everybody, a very forgettable game for the Pacers and, and one they can hopefully just throw behind them and and move forward and get ready for the Lakers because not only do they need to beat the Lakers for revenge reasons uh, from what happened Sunday, but they need to beat the Lakers because they need to win. They need to win as many games as possible 
And if they don't, then they're going to be asking other teams for help. Once again, can't rely on other teams for help. Got to take care of business at home against the Lakers and, and, and take care of the, the Nets the next day too. Like you got to have quality wins here as you're closing out the stretch, this stretch of the season. No, you, you really do. And as it relates to, to them hard, yeah, look, he had, he had a good performance, but like I still stand by it. If, Andrew Nemhard or Benedict Matherin are leading you in scoring. I think something didn't go right. And I think that those are the games that have not resulted in pace or W's because it just truly means that some of the guys that you count on of a, a, a you know, Turner, a Siakam, a Tyrese Halbert didn't really have it going that night. And I think that, uh, hey, we don't play Chicago anymore as of now. Who knows what could happen to the playing, like we said earlier. And, and I'm a little bit happy for it. Because I, I think that the Pacers, it just, for whatever reason, it didn't work out. They've had their struggles. Hey, no more Chicago for now. And the Pacers, they're looking to get back home. And I think that if you get back home, we're, we're going to see something from here. But for overall on the road trip, not a bad road trip. They go 3-2. and two. They could have went 4-1, and one, you know, if maybe everything had, had worked out, whether it's taking down the Lakers or just not kind of throwing up a stinker against Chicago. But by no means uh, did did uh, the Pacers do anything to crumble their season. Maybe, you know, the teams that they needed to lose a couple games, they also kind of helped them out a little bit. So we didn't capitalize, but we didn't fall back. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point. And it's just going to be interesting to see what happens the rest of the way, Fachi. I mean, I'm excited. Uh, to be a Pacer fan, it's great to be in this moment. And you're just, I, I think basketball reference has a Pacers pre pre predicted to finish with the six seed. Like the best chances of winning the six seed is Indiana. So we'll see how that all plays out as there's still plenty of games left on the schedule that are very impactful to the Pacers overall record. But we'll say this, you were not here for the last time we talked when we got the 41st win for the Indiana Pacers. They will not have a under 500 record this season. Uh, with after that win so uh pretty cool to see that as well but anything else before we wrap it up no look hey well it, it feels good for me to be back i wish we were celebrating something so we're just gonna have to go out there and, and get the get the dub next time be able to beat the lakers and have something to celebrate but this this time around i do think that pacers the pacers well, they'll be ready for the Lakers. And I think that hopefully the league is looking into the free throw differential a little bit off of last game. You know they're not, but, you know, you, you kind of hope they'll take that into effect. Hey, uh, this time with it being in Indiana, maybe maybe some things are different. Yeah, I would say uh, bet, bet the under on, on fouls given to the Lakers for the next game just to kind of prove a point because they got pretty dragged and raked across the coals uh, by everybody outside of the Lakers who who continue to just reply, war, more physical team, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and we'll see if LeBron James plays in this game because he did miss Wednesday night's game, I believe it was, or was it Tuesday night's game? It might have been Tuesday night's game against the 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 Bucks. With and an Anthony injury. Davis was just out for uh, uh, Wednesday night's game as we're recording this, so we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. That's what they say in the show business, as Rick Carlisle would say. But, Fachi, tell the people where they can find us at on social media. They haven't heard this in a while. Absolutely. So you can find us on Twitter at PacersPod, STP. You can find Alex on Twitter at AlexBoldNBA. I can be found on Twitter at underscore F-A-C-C-I. You can find us on Instagram at PacersPod, STP. You can find us on Facebook at Setting the Pace. You can find us on TikTok at Setting the Pace. And Alex, tell them where they can check us out on YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, go to youtube.com slash setting the pace of Pacers podcast where you can find all of our video content like this post game video you're listening to right now. So please like and subscribe and let us know what you think in the comment section below. And if you're listening to this on the audio platform, please leave us a five star rating and review and follow and subscribe to those shows as well. But Fachi, if you're ready to put those yawns behind you and get ready for some regularly scheduled Pacers basketball once again, then hit me with those three words. Let's go Pacers! <laughs>